one giant step, one giant disappointment. Maybe this will sound a bit like a funeral. It's Sean Morash and Paul Dottino. No yelling and screaming, hooting and hollering from me today. Paul, what's going on, brother? How are you? Yeah, good morning, Sean. A disappointing end to what has been a productive and exciting season. And I think, you know, as I look back at the 40 years that I've covered the team, there have been playoff runs that ended poorly. There have been playoff runs that ended with a Super Bowl championship. There are playoff runs that ended in dramatic fashion where there were nail biters and gut wrenching because you knew what could have been. Uh, that's just the nature of, of what happens in uh, in sports. And, you know, yeah. we certainly didn't think that the Giants would get whacked, but that's what happened. Yeah, and we and we have to own it. They got whacked. And, um, you know, we'll get into, you know, the positives about spinning forward and we'll certainly get into the negatives of the game. But I do think just to hit on that note, Paul, I think we're in a really unique circumstance, right? I mean, you talked about the 40 years or so around the team. I, I am somebody who's 35, turned 36 years old, and there's a lot of people in that age group, right? maybe younger, maybe a little bit older, that this is really uncharted territory on how to deal with your feelings. I say that because, Paul, as you know, it hadn't been since, what, 93 where the Giants won a playoff game and then also lost the playoff game, you know, without a trip to the Super Bowl. In fact, the last time they lost the playoff game following winning a playoff game was actually the, the Super Bowl 35 game versus the Ravens. So it has been a long time on being able to deal with the high of high of winning a playoff game followed with the losing of a playoff game. And I think for Giant fans, we just haven't experienced that swing in emotion from one week to another enough. Not that that's something you always want to experience, but... You know, I think dealing with it and then you throw in the cesspool that is social media afterwards where they're ready to throw everybody out and everybody sucks. And, you know, you forget about everything you oh. did six days earlier. It's just it's crazy. And I think that Giant fans today are, are definitely struggling with how to deal with emotionally, you know, what has unfolded over the last few weeks just to have this absolute dud of an ending versus the team they hate the most. I really love that you brought up the, the 93 scenario. I really do, um, you know, because. That was a game where, you know, after they win their first round playoff game, they go out to San Francisco and get hammered by Ricky Waters and company. And that's Phil Simms's and Lawrence Taylor's final games in the National Football League. Right. Uh, it was it was the start of a new era and the closing of the book on what was just a phenomenal era of Giants football. There was a tremendous amount of sadness, not just disappointment, but sadness because you knew what you weren't going to see again. Phil, Phil had needed the rotator cuff surgery. You know, that was going to put his status very much up in the air if, if there was any chance of him coming back. As it turned out, George Young uh, had decided, you know, with the salary cap that was in play, it wasn't worth the risk. And Lawrence had immediately announced his retirement after the 49er loss. So if you want to put something in perspective, this can't possibly even come close to a fraction of, of misery compared to what happened back in, in 93. And to be honest with you, I know it was a little bit of a different circumstance, but then you look at the excruciating way they lost to San Francisco after the 2002 season. Yeah. When, uh, you know, Richie Seifert got held on the botched field goal play. We don't forget. He, you know, and you realize that the next day the league admits to the Giants that we blew the call and you should have, you should have had a re-kick. I yeah. mean, how do you how angry do you think that made the fan base? Yeah, and that was a red hot giant team as well. My father, as the game winded down last night, kept really challenging some of us who obviously were a little younger than experienced. He he kept trying. I know he. My dad's Mister Positivity. He kept trying to hammer home that it felt a lot like losing in '85 before they really put things together in '86. Now comparing next year's team to the '86 Giants feels like blasphemy. And I know he was grasping at straws, but to him, he just kept feeling it was the same sinking feeling he had. Where ultimately, this really sucks, but I feel really good about what's to come. Well, why don't you compare it to '81? You know, when they finally made the playoffs after the dark ages beat Philadelphia in the first round, and then were, were really overmatched, although it was a bit more competitive, obviously, against San Francisco. Yeah. Why don't you think of it that way? That's true. You know, That's true. That truly was the first step in the Giants to restoring the luster on yeah. their logo. Yeah. Well, with that, Paul, 
Let's let's deep dive as only we can into exactly what unfolded last night. And I think a blanket statement needs to be said to you could talk about, oh, how could the defense be that bad? How could the offense be that bad? Everybody was bad. Okay. A- across the board, this wasn't singularly on the defense, singularly on the offense. Neither side were able to help each other. In fact, I basically was playing bad giant loss bingo and waiting for Jamie Gillen to have a snap, uh, you know, botched or a, a block punt. Somehow that didn't happen last night. But, you know, we saw last week versus Minnesota, the Eagles go right down, uh, the Vikings go right down the field. And that's what the Eagles did. And the Giants just couldn't respond, and it felt like that right away was going to be the answer. I mean, you have that chain link delay, which was ridiculous. Um, Evan Neal basically getting mauled at right tackle. Uh, Daniel Jones tripping over offensive linemen. You could tell very early on that this was a different animal and a different defense for the Giant offense to deal with. And I think that the fact that the Eagles went down and scored right away, the Giants couldn't punch back, and then the Eagles scored again when they go up 14 nothing. It just was one of those spots where – The defense was going to have no answer, and the offense was already basically in quicksand, Paul. You know, for me, um, yeah, it was a a bad first quarter, Sean, obviously uh, punctuated by the interception. Right. But, but I've seen this team show the resiliency of coming back from a couple of scores down before, especially, you know, it's only the first quarter. I'm thinking, you know what? I see the confidence that they've had for the last month. I know how how you know blue collar they've been. They're not going to let this get to them. For me, where I started to feel like, okay, this is really, really for real, and they are in serious trouble, was the eagle drive that began after the punt with about 12 and a half minutes left in the second quarter. Because as I look at my notes, and this is why, why everything took a very dark turn for me. Philly starts first down from their own 37, and Sanders runs six consecutive times and gets the ball to the Giants' 25. This winds up being a nine-play, 63-yard drive that makes it 21 to nothing, which includes only one pass. They just ran it, ran it, and ran it. And then who scores the touchdown? Boston Scott. It, That's where I said, uh-oh, there may not be a comeback here. And I got to give the Eagles this much credit, Paul. I really do. Really good teams. Great teams. Great teams know what they do well and know the other team's weaknesses. Also, great teams will put their foot in the neck and never let go. We expected this to be – we knew the Giants' weakness was in stopping the run because it had been that way – all season long. But in this era of passing in football, if you have a good quarterback and dynamic receivers, you're going to get suckered in and you're going to look to throw the ball all over the place because that's what you do well. The Eagles last night saw that that was the Giants' weakness. They saw that the Giants were able to strike back a bunch of times in Minnesota. And, Paul, they pounded the ball down our throats. They pounded the ball down our throats. And I actually have to give Nick Sirianni and the Eagles offense credit. They weren't afraid to to just say, I don't care if we just have to keep giving it to Miles Sanders, uh, Kenneth Gainwell, Boston Scott. I know the Giants can't stop this, and this is how we're going to win the game. Um, that does deserve to be credit. They could have sat back and said, we're going to try to throw to A.J. Brown as million times as possible. They, they ran the ball down the Giants' throats, and it was a good reminder going forward that for as, as positive a season as this was for the Giants defensively and Wink Martindale, Man, they need to get better stopping the run. And whether that's adding, you know, a stud linebacker or something like that. I know Leonard Williams was banged up all year. I actually thought Leonard Williams, at first glance, might have had his worst game as a Giant last night. The Eagles were not afraid to pound it down the Giants' throats. And that's a will breaker on the other side for the offense. You're sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting to get the ball back. And these drives are taking six minutes, eight minutes. Just the longest amount of time down the field that are ending in touchdowns. It is suffocating to a team to have that happen. 28 nothing at halftime. Uh, 26 carries for 140 yards as a team for Philadelphia by the time they went into the locker room and the Giants had only seven for 20. You know, Sean, when I looked at the key points uh, for the Giants to go on the path uh, to victory here, uh, and we discussed this on our program last week, 35 carries or so for at least 150 yards. Giants didn't do it. Needed to hold the ball for over 33 minutes. Giants didn't do it. They needed to hit and pound Jalen Hurts. They got zero quarterback hits on him during the course of the game. Didn't do it. Uh, The only thing that they did on those four key factors 
which I thought were all doable and were necessary to beat a team of this ilk was I didn't think they should throw the ball more than 30 times. As it turned out, they didn't. That is the only number. And, and like, what good was that without the other well, components of the formula? And, Paul, okay? I would argue. I would argue or a lot of the reason they didn't throw the ball 30 times is because they kept going three and out as well. It wasn't like they had these. Yeah, right. Drives. You know, you looked at Daniel Jones' numbers at the end of the day. He doesn't have a lot of yardage. He doesn't have a lot of completions. He doesn't have a lot of attempts. Well, it's because the drives basically were three and out all night long. Yeah. Uh, let's see what the final total was. Uh, 20 carries, 27 pass attempts. So the balance turned out to be lopsided on the passing side anyway, which we all knew was not going to be a good recipe for the Giants. So all of the things that we had agreed on and discussed that needed to happen for them to pull off this upset and thought were very doable, we really thought they were doable based on what we had seen, uh, those things did not happen. And all of us knew going in that if those things did not happen, that formula didn't mix right, it was going to take taste like a really bad can of the old New formula of Coca Cola, which I oh. know you're old enough to remember. Oh, you're the old new formula. <laughs> you, had to, you had to bring back the old, old poll. You had to bring back the old, old. Now, Paul, let me ask you this from your perspective. We can get into, I don't even want to get into the idiotic takes on Twitter. Look, Daniel Jones had a, had a bad game for him, he had a bad game. There's no denying it. Good quarterbacks have had bad games before in the postseason. It's a game that I am sure he will learn from, and there'll be plenty of time to talk about contract and what he gets paid or whatever. But in your eyes, down on that field, what went wrong for Daniel Jones last night? Was it finally the receivers not getting enough separation and open versus these great corners? Was it a matter of the O-line just not winning up front, and then we're kind of seeing the Daniel Jones of the last couple of years? Or was Daniel Jones himself just a deer in headlights last night. And you're, and you're, you know, studying football for that long. What went wrong with Daniel Jones last night? You know, I, I thought it was really a combination of things, as it often is in a situation like this. Uh, Giants were manhandled up front. There's no question about that. They did not win the trenches. And that was at the core of everything that we had discussed. So that went bad. You mentioned how uh, Reddick and, and, and the other guys on that Eagles line had Swag. their way. Right, yeah. Well, look at this. Right away, right out of the get-go, they were the ones who set the tone, Sean. The, the Giants were supposed to stand up to the bullies and not let them beat them up. And the Giants' first series, third and three, they get a sack because there was too much pressure in the pocket. Now, Jones tripped over the ankle of Andrew Thomas, but the pressure was – they were like sharks in the water, the yeah. Eagles. And, and, you know, and then on the, the fourth down, the Giants go for the fourth and eight. Now, see, that was Dable, and I know a lot of people are upset about it, but that was Dable perhaps sensing right there that if we show the Eagles respect, it may not go well. Maybe I need to throw a haymaker, just a big no. – Whopping left cross to try to wake up my team and, and to show the Eagles we will not let them push us around. We will not respect them. And it backfired because, uh, you know, they got the sack. You know, and Paul, I got to be honest, too. I can't kill Dable for that. I can't kill. First of no. all, first of all, if you're a giant fan today waking up, a lot of things went wrong. And if you think that going for it on fourth and eight is what turned the game, and maybe it did to a certain extent by not getting it. Well, I mean, you had to have loved the aggressive approach by Dable all year. Heck, part of the reason they're in this game is because Brian Dable's been aggressive throughout the year. I mean, think about it. They're basically a win away from not making the playoffs this year, or at least being right on that cusp in week 18. You know, the aggressiveness in week one is what started the whole trend. And, right. and let's be honest. Let's be honest. We talk about special teams on this podcast more than most giant, you know, anybody who wants to talk giants do. Does anybody remember a time this year where Jamie Gillen was pinning anybody between the 10 and the end zone or the five? Do we remember a lot of coffin corners from Jamie Gillen and the punt team this he year? He doesn't do that. It's not part of his repertoire. But that's that's Paul, a pitch he doesn't have. Paul, so that's the point. So if you punt there, you're probably, let's be honest, you're assuming it's going to be a touchback. If Gillen booms one, it is going to be a touchback. You're talking about what amounts to a net of 20, 25 yards, which the Eagles could have picked up in about two plays. So to go for it there, trust your offense a little bit. If you if you get it, then it's a, a a haymaker back to the Eagles, like you said, where it's 
whoa, whoa, okay. You know, Giants came to play tonight. I did not have a problem going for it. Of course, every coach is going to look like an idiot if it fails. It failed, but I didn't mind the attempt. I would also tell you that from watching uh, the pregame kickers on the field, it was clear to me that both kickers outside chance was going to be a 55-yarder. As it turned out, Dable said afterwards that their line of delineation was the 35-yard line, which is a 52-53 yard kick. In this particular case, they were fourth down at the 40. So that means it's a 57 or 58 yarder. And that definitely was not going to work. You could tell during pregame warmups, these kickers did not have that quote booming range that they normally would have. Now, and obviously, Paul, going forward, and again, we'll have plenty of offseason stuff to get to. Look, the Giants are going to have to be able to hit quarterbacks more, hit guys like Jalen Hurts more. They're going to have, they're going to see him twice a year. Uh, you know, whether that means just simply Thibodeau and Ojolari healthier and better, um, they, they'll get there and, and I think they'll be okay. Offensively, Paul, I, I think the one question mark I have for the team is I kept waiting all year long to feel like I was going to see more consistent development in Evan Neal. And I thought Evan Neal was a killer last night. And if I had one cause for concern going forward of any of the guys that we know will be here next year, it's, man, I hope that Evan Neal takes that step forward. Because even by the end of his rookie year, Andrew Thomas had taken steps. Now, he couldn't shed the public you know, flogging he got for the first half of his, his year, but he came together that second half of the rookie year. Felt like we still last night, still having the same questions about Evan Neal. By the time the season was over, Neil had been dealing with a chronic knee injury, a shoulder injury, an ankle injury. He was a shell of himself, uh, been beaten up significantly through his rookie season. Okay. I'm not going to use that as an excuse because obviously as the season went on, he was picking up different things, you know, as a quote, one year veteran. They always say rookies aren't rookies by the time they get to December. But I think between him hitting the rookie wall, and having to battle through a number of things while he was trying to learn on the fly, I think it, it turned into a disappointing second half for him. But I'm not doubting what he has inside. I think from what I from what I can tell, and I've talked to him many, many times. In fact, talked to him for the pregame show this past week. Uh, he is a kid who understands what he needs to learn and is very willing to do it. And it, let's face it, technique-wise, that's what he's got to clean up. This isn't a matter of want to. This isn't a matter of not physically being able to. It's a matter of just being able to learn all the techniques to play at a high level in this league. Now, Paul, obviously this is, I'm going to ask this knowing that you know not, not you know nothing, John Snow. You know nothing. I'm just going based on your opinion, watching this team being around this team. Do you think, because you know the fans are out for pitchforks, whether it's Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley, insert whatever name you hear, do you think that there are some guys on this team last night who perhaps either did or should be looked at a little differently than they were heading into the game as far as what to do with them in the offseason? No, uh, in terms of your core players, no. Yeah, like like Jones no. is the obvious one. Do you think last night that bad performance makes the giant front office go, oh, hold on here? No, no, I, I do. I not. agree. I agree with you. I, I, I completely do not. agree with you. And you, and you mentioned Barkley got so few touches anyway. Yeah. How could how could anybody put a stain on on a season that he had based on last night? How could how could you do that? I agree with you. Uh, and I'll just say this because I've already seen. I've been basically waving the Daniel Jones pom poms of defense because I couldn't believe. Now look, I guess I should believe because you know Twitter is basically a cesspool of these people. Um. <laughs> If you're just pointing at 15 touchdown passes and that's why, you know, well, look, the guy only threw 15 touchdown passes. First of all, he didn't play the last game. So if you want to count the Viking game at 17, second of all, he ran seven in. Should he start sliding at the one when he's going in for a touchdown to throw more for you? Count the total touchdowns. Um, Daniel Jones had a bad game yesterday as the whole team did. Outside of Patrick Mahomes and Tom Brady early in their career, what good quarterback hasn't had bad playoff clunkers? Jeez, Hurts did a year ago. Look at him this year. I mentioned on Twitter, Peyton Manning at the 41 nothing loss to the Jets. Eli Manning getting shut out versus the Carolina Panthers. I know it's a weird mindset to put us in because Jones is in year four, but it's almost as if, and I look at the whole team across the board, same thing goes with Dexter Lawrence. View all these guys the same way. You almost have to throw out those last two years with, with Judge Garrett Kitchens because everything was just so horrible for these guys. Right. It felt like to me this was truly Daniel Jones' second year as you could erase that from his memory. 
these young quarterbacks, man, they all have these playoff clunkers. It's part of the deal. They get better. They learn from them. To suddenly dismiss what Jones did a week ago and say, well, it was the Vikings. Oh, it was still a road playoff game versus a team that won 13 games. They faced a much better roster yesterday. And you know what? It's a learning experience. I'm not ready to dump Jones out and forget all the good he built up. And oh, by the way, are we to assume that this was it, that he's not going to continue to get better with Brian Dable? Right, exactly. The The line should continue to improve. Uh, I expect Barkley to be back. You know, these were things that, that didn't help him last night. You know, this this was a throwback game, all right? they They've had – forget about the, the second half, okay? The first half is where this game was decided. When it was 28 nothing, right? We right. knew. Right. It was it was one of the worst halves the Giants had this year. They had a similar half in Dallas. You remember the first game against the Cowboys? Of course. Yeah. You you'll remember the first game against the Eagles, right? Yeah. And you remember the one half they put together against the Lions, which we know that day flu was running through the entire team and and guys were literally had stomach issues throughout the whole four quarters. Right. So let's let's even kind of push that a little bit to the side. So they they had a small uh, a sampling size of these dreadful halves where everything went wrong. Everything went wrong. So I'm not going to look at this and say, well, Daniel Jones is Kirk Cousins. He's a fantasy football quarterback who's great during the regular season and then chokes during the playoffs. No, you can't do that because this was not an isolated instance. The Giants as a team, unfortunately, did have, uh, you know, these types of halves during the course of the season. The bad news is two of them were against playoff teams within their own division, which really goes back to the question you asked before about what do you do in terms of moving forward here and 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 what do you see as being the stuff that that's still got to get better. Well, you got to get better in your division, and the Giants clearly will know that as step two of this foundation continues to be built. Yeah, Paul, I agree. And look, I am going to have – we're going to deal with this. We're going to take our punch. We're going to take our medicine as Giant fans. I know in my heart of hearts I'm going to be so ex- – more excited than I was for this year, so excited come next summer. But the one thing – the Giants checked off a big box this year. They no longer became homecoming for teams, right? They Not only did they make the playoffs, they beat the bad teams. They didn't become the bad team that the bad teams beat. The next right. check on that box, they got to figure out a way to start beating the Cowboys and the Eagles. They just have to. If you're going to be true competitors, you got to build a team. You have two good teams in your division. You know, Washington's good too, but like two really good teams in Dallas and Philly. And I know I speak for a lot of Giant fans. It, it, it's becoming painfully – no matter how good the seasons are, constantly losing to the Eagles and Cowboys, that's the next culture shift for this team. That is the next step next year. It has to be done. So whatever this front office needs to look at, whatever the coaching staff needs to look at, they need the, – these are the teams you see all year long. These are the teams you're competing with. You need to build teams, like many do, to compete in your division – the Cowboy Eagles stuff at the start. I was stunned last night, Paul, at halftime. Stunned. How many ass kickings versus the Eagles do I have to see? And then at halftime, they pop it up there. First time in the history of the rivalry, the Giants trailed 28 nothing at the half. Are you kidding me? The Eagles have done yeah. everything, everything to tear my heart out and stomp at it for 20 years, at least. And I, that's just me. And they had never led 28 nothing at the half. That has to change. The Giants yeah. have to find a way to build a roster to beat this Eagle team. Yeah, there, there, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. Now, the problem, of course, is that Philadelphia looks like they've already, because they had an early start than the Giants did, uh, they look like they've already got themselves set up. I mean, they're yeah. they're a true Super Bowl contender. No doubt. We knew that all year long, okay? And with the draft choices that they have, they have some extra draft choices I coming know. That's around. That's the killer. That's the killer. All right? This, this Eagles team is going to be the team to beat in the division for the next several years. There's just no other way around it. They, they're going to be there. Uh, I'm not so sure exactly where Dallas stands because their cap is a mess. Right. It's kind of like what the Giants' cap was. Yeah. Uh, so the Giants are in much better cap space than I think the Cowboys are moving forward. And I still think at least the Giants know, I think they know, they've got some – some really good foundational players yeah. that should give them a nice three- to four-year window. I'm not so sure that I could say that with as much confidence about Dallas right now. So for me, 
Philly's more the team that I think is going to be the challenge for the Giants at the top of the division for the next few years. Yeah, I mean, hard to argue, right? I mean, the Giants were at least in both Cowboy games, even if they got away from them late. And, you know, these Eagle games, obviously throughout the, the second one, but the first one and the third one, they were just brutal. But it's just, it's a painful punch to keep. I, I can't stand the Eagles. I hate their fans. This sucks. I don't want to lose the Eagles, but that's part of it. But, Paul, I, I will say this. Look, in the end, I know nobody wants to hear the positive spin. This team played in the divisional round of the NFC playoffs on a year many of us had them pegged for six wins, eight wins max, something like that. They end up going to the divisional round. They get their ass kicked, sure. But it is okay to deal with this loss, be really upset, and take a step back and go, that was one hell of a year. And that it doesn't feel like a one-off. Like you said, it's not a bunch of guys retiring. This should only continue to grow. And, oh, by the way, if the Eagles are that much better and the Giants can't catch them, I think the Giants proved they're right there. They're one of the four best teams in the NFC. Is the, you know, the Packers and Rams kind of flagged their way out. We're not that far off. We are. It felt like we're that far off. But like football, couple players here or there. They get a you know a good run playing linebacker in here. They add a big receiver, whether it's through the draft or elsewhere. The Giants are not that far off, even if last night felt like they were a million years off. Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything you just said, Sean. They found a reason to give second contracts to their franchise running back uh, and their franchise quarterback. And I think, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but even the biggest Giants critics this past summer were all saying, well, what happens if Jones flares out? Your franchise is going to be set back for years because you're going to need the new a new franchise QB. Or what if he's just like, okay? Boy, then what are you going to do? Right. Then you got to figure out what what kind of contract do you offer this guy? Right? No, that's not what happened. That's not what happened. Jones is the guy. Saquon Barkley is the guy. You got the answers, the most important answers that you needed to get this year in this quote first year of the new regime in which you were supposed to see improvement. You didn't just get that. You got some answers. And no they doubt. were good ones. No doubt. No doubt. We will we will sit back. And by the time you're listening to this, maybe you already know what happened with the Cowboys and Niners. I can tell you, me and Paul will be rooting hard for the 49ers. But from there on out, we have to sit there and we'll watch an Eagle team maybe go to a Super Bowl and we'll deal with it. But we are taking one giant step forward as an organization. So, look. We don't know uh, what's going to happen here. Some off-season stuff. I'm sure me and Paul are going to get together and we're going to figure out, you know, how often we're going to come your way. But I want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. All the listeners we gained. And I know we gained you because every time the, the podcast wasn't up on time, I saw tweets. So people were listening. So I appreciate you guys you guys listening. Paul, I know you do too. It was uh, – and look, Paul – they put us together at the beginning of the year saying, these two on a bad giant team are going to go at each other's throats. We're going to use them for fodder on every WFAN show. And I walk away after a season of the divisional round, and I, I tell this to anybody I talk to. I was on with the Talk of Giants guys. I love Paul Dottino, the man. I love Paul Dottino. I'm so happy we got to do this this year, get to know each other a little bit. Mutual respect for each other. Paul, yes, sir. Yes, this was sir. A great, we had a lot of fun, man. We had a lot I, of fun. I agree. Sean, you're right. Uh, I fully expected that we would be like the Jerry Lewis punchline <laughs> on all of the morning and afternoon shows. I fully expected it. Uh, I, I I thought the fireworks would be flying left and right, and it turned out, look at us now. We're totally kumbaya. Yeah. And it really started that way, From to be honest with you, from the first couple of shows. No doubt. I and, think, boy, and, I think you, you know, realize. I hope, and I hope the fans understand in all honesty, look, you've been you've been rooting for this team as a love fest, and and honestly, my work, my dream was to be a, a, a sportscaster who could cover the Giants. That was my dream my whole life, and I'm living it. So you know, when you have that kind of passion for what you do, or for the hobby or the 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 fandom that you root for, it, it really probably shouldn't have been such a surprise that we would mesh. Of course. And what you end up coming away with after 20 weeks plus or whatever the heck this all added up to, uh, you and I think a lot more alike than I think uh, the bosses gave yeah. us credit for when it came to the Giants. And we That's both, in the too. end, wanted the same thing, and we saw it. A, a nice little Giant playoff run here. So, Paul, look, they can continue to follow us on Twitter and, and stay subscribed here because, you know, we're going to try, you know, the offseason's coming. So, clearly, we're going to decompress here a little bit, and we will have news and stuff to come with you. Paul, where they can, can, can they continue to get you on Twitter? 
at Giants WFAN. And you can continue to follow me at Mraz CBS. Thank you to our producer, Adam, who's done a wonderful job here. Uh, you know, even if he tried to nose me out of the podcast at times, the host, he's just been an unbelievable producer. Uh, bust his chops a little bit. But thank you, everybody. It's been a pleasure doing this season. And look, big off season and big things to come. This wasn't a one-off. The Giants are going to continue to take one giant step forward. Thank you, everybody, for joining us all year. Let's go, Big Blue.